Hey, thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Spirit Anointed Leadership, a podcast designed to equip, empower, and encourage us as we go after the mission that God has given us together of reaching those who are not yet in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm so excited that you've chosen to join us today because we have an incredibly awesome guest with us today, Brent Bickle. Now, Brent has been a friend of mine for a long, long time. I don't even want to, I don't want him to tell you how long we've been friends because that would age me. But I've had the privilege of knowing Brent, watching him actually in during his high school years and then his college years. And and then God would eventually lead Brent to, to, to plant a church. And we're going to talk about that today. But uh, God has done some amazing things in the life of their church. And I just, man, I want to get right to that because I want him to share of all the stuff that Holy Spirit's been doing in their midst. So Brent, thanks so much for joining me today. It's a privilege to have you on, it really is. Um, Chris, so, thank you, and it's an honor for me too, so thank well, you. Well, praise God. So <laughs> Brent, for people that don't know, why don't you give them a little bit, give us a little bit of your background, and then uh, the fact of God ultimately calling you to do what you and your awesome wife, Laura, are doing these days. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So. Um, so I grew up as a PK, which uh, for people that may not know, pastor's kid, right? <laughs> um, and uh, mom and dad were awesome. Dad is a pastor like for, you know, long before I was born. And uh, so grew up in a pastor's home, going to church whenever the doors were open. That mm. normal kind of a thing that a lot of people might say. I yep. uh, had one brother, younger brother that... Um, Usually, you know, as the older brother, I didn't pick on him, but he, man, he picked on me. He pushed my <laughs> buttons. And uh, Bryce is awesome. Uh, love you, Bryce. And uh, But, you know, the home that we grew up in was a very um, solid, followed Jesus very, very faithfully, um, and just a loving, supportive, amazing, very active. We were in sports, a lot of that, that kind of home. I uh, grew up mostly, and I've lived mostly in the Midwest my whole life, growing up, born in Indiana. Mm -hmm. Uh, lived in South Dakota for a while, then Wisconsin. So, uh, yeah, amazing, amazing time growing up. So. That's awesome. So you graduate from college, and eventually you sent and you served in some other places, uh, and eventually you felt God leading you to plant a church. Talk to us about that venture in your and Laura's life. How'd that come about? Yeah, so uh, a lot of people don't know this, actually, but Laura and I were public school teachers out of college. I did not go to college to go into ministry. That was not the path that I felt. Um, and so moved to North Carolina. I taught history in a public high school, okay. coach soccer, mm -hmm. and uh, Laura was a third grade teacher. And uh, But then uh, I went to an evening service at a mm -hmm. local church there in North Carolina, and it was kind of, I've heard these stories before, but you know, the speaker was speaking, he was doing a great job, but honestly, I don't have a clue what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason was because Holy Spirit was so loud mm. in my ears and in my heart and my soul. Mm. Uh, and I was, you know, I was spiritually trembling. I remember that, wow. but I was also physically trembling in the mm. midst of the service. Mm. And I knew in that moment that God was getting ready to do something or call me to something that I was scared of. Wow. And so for the next couple of months, I wrestled with this. And I, I, I would physically and spiritually tremble for diff several different times. I'm still a public school teacher. Even at school, this would happen. Wow. And so I told Laura finally, I said, I don't know what God is trying to say. So I need to spend a whole day alone with God just to determine, discern what he's trying to say. Yeah. And so we picked a day, and I drove to the mountains of North Carolina. Again, we lived in North Carolina. The mountains were right there. Okay. So I drove there, and I took my Bible. I took another book, uh, a piece, some pieces of paper, and something to write with. I didn't even bring music. Chris, I know you love music. I love yeah. music. Right. But I knew that music for this day was going to get in the way. Okay. That's what I felt. Yeah. And so I asked God two questions at the beginning of that day. Because this is, I was starting to feel a couple, you know, kind of where God was leading. Yeah. And uh, and so I asked him these two questions at the beginning of the day. I mm. asked God, I said, God, do you want me to be in full time ministry for the rest of my life? Mm. And then the second question was, if you do, where do you want me to go? OK. And I said, God, wow. today is all about me listening and you don't have to answer them today. I know you may not answer them today, but this mm. day is for you to speak into my life in whatever way you want. Okay. Those are the two questions I have. 
Okay. So Chris, I can tell you, I would love to say like in that moment, then God just answered one of those questions. He didn't. I spent all day hiking, praying, listening, and it wasn't until three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. And I've been praying, I've been reading God's word, I've been writing. God had been give, downloading all kinds of cool ideas, but he mm. hadn't said a word about either of the two questions. <laughs> I'm like, come on, God, we're getting late in the day here. I, I would really like an answer of some kind. So finally, late in the afternoon, I'm sitting there looking out over a valley, mm. and uh, mm. it was the first, it's the only time that I've actually seen a vision of God and heard God vo- God's voice audibly. Wow. And I don't know, Chris, have you seen those old Uncle Sam posters like from World War II where yeah. he's pointing at the poster and he's pointing directly at you? You yes. know, that kind of thing? I want you. I saw Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> and Jesus was in front of the cross. He wasn't hanging on the cross. He was in front of the cross. Mm. And I saw Jesus and he pointed his finger directly at me. Mm. And he said, I want you. Wow. And it was this moment immediately emotion and just Holy Spirit anointed just flooded over. And I knew in that moment that I want you, those three words, and that vision said, yes, you're going to be in ministry for the rest of your life. And so at that point, then it was just, I went home, I told Laura, and now it's just like, okay, all go. I taught for one more year in the public school system, but it's like, okay, we're doing ministry for the rest of our life. And the rest is history, so to speak. Wow. So you end up, if I remember right, you end up eventually in Williston, North Dakota, serving at a church there called New Hope. And then, yep. um, and then eventually, not long after that, then God ends up calling you to plant a church outside of Madison, Wisconsin, in this community called Wanakee. And uh, you and I share some history there, which is cool, but we won't go into that today. So, when did you and when did you and Laura plant North? What would become Northridge? What is now Northridge? When did you guys plant that church? Yeah, so we planted it, it'll be um, officially about 11 years ago now. Okay, okay. Um, and so we moved to the area 2010, launched like some ministries 2011, and then officially like started services 2012. Okay. Uh, so okay. this September will be 11 years. And mm. Chris, it was, it was really this same thing that I just talked about before the call to ministry. I felt this physical, spiritual trembling. Wow. And uh, and I knew God was calling me to something that was I was going to be totally scared of. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even know what it was. Mm-hmm. And then eventually God brought like six opportunities, six jobs, so to speak. I wow. knew it was probably transferring away from Williston, North Dakota to somewhere else. Okay. And there's these six options on the table. Mm-hmm. Basically what God did, he didn't so much say you're going to plant a church in Dane County. He did. Mm-hmm. But this is how he did it. I think he did it for my benefit because of my personality. Okay. Uh, God said, Brent, I want you to call all the other pastors, all these other job opportunities, and I want you to turn them all down, except mm. for this one thing of church, church planting, planting a church in Dane County. Mm. And I think God knew it was harder for me to turn all plan B, C, D, E, and F down mm. than saying I'm going to go for plan A. Yep. But what God did is he said, all you have left is now plan A, because that's mm. the one that you have to do. Wow. And so then we moved to uh, Dane County. We didn't even know where the church was going to be. We didn't know it was going to be Wanakee, but we prayed, we discerned, and then eventually it became Wanakee, and we, we planted Northridge Church. So you so Northridge Church has existed now, as you said, officially from your launch team, or excuse me, your launch service, about 11 years. And... You guys have been meeting in this really cool community center uh, for the last 11 years. And there have been some challenges with that. um, And there have been some good things about that. But eventually you felt like, man, it's time for us to begin to think about what would what would it look like for us to have our own facility? Um, And you're still in rented facilities today. But in order to get to your own facility, you're going to have to raise some serious money in order to make that happen. And so serious money. Yeah, so give us a sense, first of all, and obviously some of us serve in places where money is not super expensive. Others of us serve in places where money is really expensive. Give us a sense of what you felt like just the land alone might cost you if you're going to have your own yeah. facility. Yeah, so Madison, Chris, as you well know, because we do have history that ties back to the same area, Madison's a desirable place to live. It's the capital of Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin's there. It's an active city. There's bike paths, trails, running paths. They host the Ironman. 
there's a uh, hundred thousand different reasons why people want to move to Madison and stay mm. in Madison, live there. Okay. And so it's highly desirable, which means land yep. is a premium. So, yep. uh, for example, I was just looking actually, honestly, this morning I was mm. looking at some land, and uh, it's three acres, and it was six hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the three acres. Wow. Uh, which means no house. This is not a house for Brett and Laura. This is not like <laughs> this is three acres of nothing but land. For six hundred fifty thousand dollars, this is soil, Earth's crust. There you go. <laughs> just, go. You're looking at a piece of property, yeah. and uh, and so if you think like for our church, we figure probably five to ten acres is what we probably need for the building, the parking lot, you know, a little bit of landscaping around it, and and you're talking about well, way over a million dollars between a million and a half, maybe even $2 million just to get the land. And so, yeah, yeah. Chris, it's you're looking at a mountain is what yeah. you're doing and you're going, I don't even see how this is possible. Yeah, so let's, let's take that for just a second. And I don't mean to ask a stupid question here, but for some people, for all of us, because here's the thing, all of us at some point in our ministry career, uh, if we're pastors, we typically at some point have to raise money. Like we have to think about what does it look like to call people to stewardship? Um, and that's really what I wanna focus in on now for the, ne for the next few moments. And that is, is that, Brett, would it be fair to say that you had never had to raise a significant amount of money prior to what Northridge has been through in the last couple of years? Is, is that a fair statement? Totally fair statement, Chris, absolutely. And, um, and something that I'm totally not comfortable with. Okay. Uh, it's not something that I'm not, I'm not a natural, like, uh, I need to, I'm a salesman. I, I'm going to sell this. I'm going to go ask for money and all of, that's just something that is so far from my comfort zone. Okay. Um, I, I understand the importance of it. Sure. It's just sure. not a comfortable thing for me. And yep. so, no, I had never done that. I'd never, I'd never done a campaign. I've never asked for large amounts of money. Um, n have never done any of that stuff. Yeah. Okay. So very uncomfortable with it for sure. So so what you discerned and your leadership team discerned ultimately was that you were going to hire uh, a, a, a firm, a, a fundraising partner. Um, and in your case, you guys, is, you guys decided to go with Enjoy Stewardship Services, right? ISS, is that what they're still called? Um, yep. And okay, so you went with, you went with ISS. And um, so talk to me about what did it feel at the very beginning to be in a in a partnership, if I can, if we can just be candid, two guys having a conversation, was there a little yeah. uh, trepidation on your part saying these guys are going to come in and try and like strip my sheep, like they're gonna they're gonna use you know like these tactics that um, are gonna try and steal a bunch of money? Like what came to your mind when you first started thinking about using an outside firm, a, a fundraising firm? What was that like for you? Oh man, that's a great question, and uh, you're throwing some doozies at me, aren't you? From side, <laughs> and this is this is good. The truth is, Chris, you're hitting into my personality, which is uh, I don't like to admit it, but I'm a little bit of a control guy. And hey, Andy so Stanley the, says the, every church planter or church leader is a control freak. Just get over it. So we all okay. are. So it's a good thing. <laughs> okay, so there you go. I'm you're not sure that company. I can get over it myself, but that's that's right. Good company. <laughs> But, uh, but all that to say, Chris, yeah, there was a ton of fear. In mm -hmm. fact, let me just talk about this. Before we got to the point where we hired Enjoy, uh, God had laid um, Joshua 3, 15 and 16 on my heart, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and this, this- Now, everyone's got the I Old Testament memorized, but for people like me that don't have the Old <laughs> Testament completely memorized, can remind me yeah. of what Joshua 3, 15 and yeah, 16 yeah, says. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely, absolutely. Well, and I didn't, I, I, I had an idea what it was, even when he laid it on my heart, I was like, I need to look that up to make sure I'm right, <laughs> you know? Um, but Joshua 3, 15 16 is this, this beautiful moment where God has already asked Joshua and the nation of Israel to cross a flooded Jordan River to get to the land, to get to the space that he has promised to them. Yeah. And 15 and 16 is the moment when God has asked them to step into the flooded water hmm. and God doesn't show them anything until they step into it. Hmm. And I didn't know that this meant camp, capital campaign hmm. at the moment. I didn't know that that's what it meant. Hmm. But there's this moment where they step in the water. Of course, God stops the water. They can walk across on dry land. Yeah. And and what God said is your stepping into the water is you doing a capital campaign. 
Wow. You that you are scared to death of this. You are you're scared, Brent, to lead out and to step out and say, I think God wants to do this amazing thing, and you're scared to do it because you're not sure if God's going to do it. Wow. If God's going to show being up. Honest. Yeah. If God, let's let's be honest. There's a difference between we know and believe that God can show up and us believing that God is going to show up. Yes. I mean, th- those are two different things. I believe God can do anything. Sure. My theology is straight on that. Okay. Right. But God, will God do that? Right. Well, we have to trust and believe that and put our you know, our faith where, where it is. And so God was, this capital campaign and hiring Enjoy was all that. That's what it was, is God mm-hmm. saying, are you willing, Brent, are you willing, Northridge Church, to step into the river before mm-hmm. I show you what I'm going to do? Praise God. And so, that, was a, that was scary stuff, but we which, did. Which, which is huge, <laughs> and I just want to commend you. And so many, so many of those who are listening right now can relate to that. They can say, yes, I sense the Holy Spirit is calling me to take a giant step here. And sometimes that's in the area of finances and, and asking God to help us when it comes to raising funds. And so many pastors get freaked out at that point, so they just step away, and they miss out on some of the great miracles that God wants to do. And God did a miracle in your sense. So what every fundraising firm I've ever known that works with churches does is they come in and they they do an analysis of your church and they they figure out, you know, uh, what they think you can raise. So let's just go for it. What did did ISS, what did Enjoy Stewardship Services, what did they say that you guys would probably likely be able to raise? Yeah, so they do a whole analysis, right? They look at all of our givers, uh, what are trends, all kind of stuff. And so... This is important because what they're doing is they're not doing on a feeling. They're not praying about it necessarily. Enjoy is coming in. We hired them as coaches and analysts to tell us based on science and math, what should our church be able to do? Okay. That's that's what this is. And so what they did is they gave us a range and they gave us a low number of 300,000. Okay. A mid range number of 450,000 and a high range of 600,000. So that was the range. The range is 300,000 on the low end, 600,000 on the high end. So that's what they said. Based on okay. science and math, that's what you should be able to do. Okay, now, Brent, I'm gonna ask you to share this part of it quickly with us. And then I wanna, we're gonna make sure that people have the, the opportunity to reach out to you uh, personally so they can ask more questions about this. And I, I know your spirit well enough that you'll allow people to do that, which I'm really thankful for. But. The thing is, is that as people like ISS and other people, RCI and other people talk about, this is not really a money issue. This really is a heart and discipleship and stewardship issue. Ultimately, this is a matter of the heart. So before we get to the number of what you of what the Lord really did, talk to us for just a minute about the uh, the spiritual aspect of this. So many people are afraid to do it because they think they're just asking for money. But actually, this is a huge discipleship opportunity. Is that right? Absolutely, Chris. This is the best part Hmm. by far is the spiritual part, what God did and what God is still doing. Let me just Hmm. say that the financial aspect was great, but the spiritual anointed God, just Holy Spirit coming down and working in ways that we never could imagine. That's the best part of this. And Hmm. it's funny to say that attached to a capital campaign because a capital campaign, everybody makes it about money it's all about what's the number what are we going to raise of course that's part of the focus but god did some amazing so so what we did is uh chris we simply called this campaign yes Hmm. one word yes and and the reason was simple we asked everybody to simply say yes to whatever god was asking them to say yes to that's Hmm. it Hmm. whatever that is sure it could be spiritual it could be financial it could be sacrifice it could be it doesn't matter what it is Yep. Whatever, don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Don't, don't, don't worry about what Pastor Brent is asking you. Don't worry about all this other stuff. What you need to worry about is what is God asking you to say yes to? You say yes to that. Hmm. And, and so before we asked anybody to consider any kind of financial sacrifice, we said, first, listen to what God is telling you to do. Hmm. And so how we did that, Chris, is we spent 21 days hmm. on a spiritual journey. Awesome. And and Chris, I would just I just want to say in this moment, like I I'm the one that gets to talk about this, but I had an entire team, my whole staff, hmm. volunteers, our campaign director Chris that did like kept this whole thing running. Yep. She did this all volunteer. Wow. The gal in our church, it was amazing. Hmm. Um, and so like we had all these things, 
And and so the spiritual aspect, people fasted mm-hmm. from food, people fasted from items, people fasted from their favorite stuff and hobbies that they wanted to do. We had uh, get this, this is in January, February, March in Wisconsin. People somebody fasted from hot showers in the wow. winter. Oh uh, my gosh. Somebody else fasted I know, right? Somebody fasted from negativity. Wow. <laughs> I was like, well, that's that's actually really hard to do. Yes. Uh, we had kids fasting from their favorite foods. We had kids fasting from their mm. electronic devices. Wow. We had it, uh, we had we had all these things going on. Uh, Chris, it was just the spiritual aspect of what mm. God did. And and I'm sure I, I, we'll probably get to this a little bit later, kind of what the fruit of this was. Yeah. Um, but God did some amazing things. He unified us in such a beautiful, beautiful way. Um, mm. And like we had Pastor Nick, somebody on staff, you can see yeah. that. Yeah. There's this spiritual journey guidebook, 21 days. He put this together. Again, when I say uh, I didn't make this up, mm. I, I sure. just signed off on it. I was like, oh, it's awesome. You know, that's mm. it. Yep. But people went through that. And they said, "Can we do that all the time?" Wow. <laughs> I was like, "Well, maybe not create our own book every month, you yeah. know." Yeah. But but I mean, people loved it. God did some amazing things. He spoke loudly to people, and people listened. And we'll get into what God did here in a minute. Yeah. Uh, but it was it was incredible. Yeah. So we're running out of time. So I want to get to that point now. But here's the thing. I want to back up and say, Holy Spirit invited you to step out into the Jordan River by yeah. being willing to go into a capital campaign. And because of your obedience, Brent, then all of a sudden, um, the whole church began to grow spiritually. And you saw right before your eyes, people who had never fasted before, now people are fasting hot showers. They're fasting warm showers. They're gonna take cold showers for three months simply to say, God, I want you first. Like, that's amazing. And you've got this great firm that says somewhere between three hundred and six hundred thousand dollars and $600,000. So let's go for it. Tell us the number. What did Holy Spirit do in your midst? How much did you guys end up raising? Yeah. So this is this is also one of the best parts. Uh, you know, we were supposed to raise three hundred to six hundred thousand, right? That was what science and math told us. Yeah. We had a kid who's about six years old in the service when I shared those numbers, and we got a text from his mom, and she said she shared. She said, "So Blake thinks that those numbers are way too easy and achievable." And he wrote new goals, and his top number was a million dollars. Wow! And I'm which like, would, wow, which would be awesome. awesome. Well, right? Which would be unbelievable. Like we blew six hundred thousand out of the water. Right. Well, Blake turned out to be a prophet because Chris re raised one point three eight million dollars. Wow! One point three million dollars is what is yep. what ended up being pledged and raised. So you've already got a, a lot of that in the bank already. When the and I'm when the capital campaign company told you it was going to be between three and six hundred thousand dollars. I mean, God did a miracle in your midst, right? I mean, it's just like, wow. And and here's it, the thing: it was, it was amazing. Yeah, and and here's the thing, and that is just that those people will never be the same again. Like, they're not only transformed. Uh, because of their sacrificial giving, they're transformed because of the discipleship process that they went through leading up to it. Um, and then they're part of a, of a community of faith that did this, that is, that's doing this together, right? And the, the camaraderie, camaraderie that's there and the sense of community that's there is like none other. Like, those folks will never be the same again. They've put a stake in the ground, if you will. And I just have to go back and say, Brent, that was because of your willingness to be obedient to the heavenly calling and launch out into your own Jordan River. And Brent, I celebrate that with you. It's not over yet. You still got to buy the property God wants you guys to buy and eventually begin to build on it. And it's one step by two steps. This is not the first or only capital campaign you guys will probably have. You'll have to have multiple ones. And and I get that. But I, Mm -hmm. I celebrate, Brent, with you the fact that it, you know, as we close today, hear my heart. You and I are good friends. You know how deeply I believe in you. You've said about yourself, look, I'm not the most amazing, you know, fundraiser on the face of the planet. I'm not a salesman. That's not how God has wired me. But what you were, Brent, was what you were obedient to what Holy Spirit told you to do. And because of that, this whole thing just exploded in a good way. And lives have been transformed by the gospel. And so I celebrate that. I celebrate 
people that are coming, coming to faith, and I celebrate people that are growing in their discipleship because of the opportunity you gave them to do that. So way to go, Brent. Um, thank God for what he's done in your midst. Um, any last thing that you say to a pastor leader who's thinking, ah, I gotta go into a capital campaign, but I'm too afraid. Anything you'd say to them? <laughs> what I would say is, um, yeah, thanks, Chris, is the capital campaign raised money, and that was wonderful. Mm. But people are getting baptized. Marriages have been transformed. Praise God. Kids gave sacrificially, and it changed families. Mm. Um, we saw marriages uh, that were fighting about money who are now making some of the easiest financial decisions of their lives as a result of this. God. God changed everything. Mm -hmm. And so Praise what God. I would say is, if you're worried about asking for money, don't worry about making it about money because it's not about money. What mm -hmm. it's about is listening to what God is telling you to do and what God is going to do in the lives of your people mm -hmm. and how he's gonna engage your church to reach more people for Jesus in your community because that's what we are seeing and it's not just because of the capital campaign, but it is one of those things where God said, if you do this, you watch what I can do, Amen. what only I can do. So I would just say, step out in faith, do it. <laughs> Amen. Well, Brent, thanks so much, friend, for being with us. It means so much to me. Here's the thing. I, I want to encourage you, pastors and leaders, as you've taken in this content today, as we've learned, as we've celebrated, and Brent, by the way, we celebrate $1.3 million. Uh, we celebrate that. I just really want to encourage you to share this with a friend who might be going through uh, this exact thing or needs to go into a capital campaign. Share with this, subscribe to it, like it, uh, review it. That's really, really helpful if you review. And make sure, if you can, take the time right now to pass it on to a friend that you know that needs to raise some money. Like right now, send it to him in a message, send it to him in an email, send it to him in some way, shape or form. Make sure you do that because if you'll do that, you'll end up blessing them through Brent's life and more and more people will end up getting blessed through that. And God's name and his fame will be wider and greater as a result of your help. So Brent, thanks again for being with us and thank you for joining us. Let's go out and let's be spirit anointed leaders who listen, just like Brent did, who listen sometimes with fear and trembling to the things the Holy Spirit says to us. We're obedient with that. And then it gives God an opportunity to show off his greatness, his goodness, his majesty, his power, and the way that he can just provide resources. So thanks again for tuning in today. Let's be the spirit anointed leaders that he's called us to be. Have an awesome day.